So if you were going to tell someone about Jesus, say a neighbor or a co-worker or someone at school, what would you say? What would you highlight about his life? Or if someone asked you, hey, tell me about your relationship with him. What does he mean to you? What do you love about Jesus? What would you say? And so I'm going to pause just a moment right now, and actually I'm going to give you an opportunity. And as we look to our text, this is in uh, John chapter 12. They're going to go grab the microphones right now. In John chapter 12, if you, can, you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to it. John chapter 12. We're going to see a question asked by Greeks. These are non-Jewish people coming to Jerusalem for the Passover. Asking a request, sirs, we want to see Jesus. And so we'll see in our text today ways in which Jesus wants to be seen, okay? And there's a lot of notes, and I have notes for you. My, my heart is that you remember one sentence, one phrase, one concept that will impact you. But uh, this is what I'm going to ask you to do. So we're going to put a sentence on the, on the screen. There it is. One thing I love about Jesus is... And I want you to finish that sentence, whatever comes to mind. So these two guys are going to come up and down. So here it is. One thing I love about Jesus is, and so if you want to finish that sentence, there's a hand back there. Put your hands up. So, yep, guys, just go and go in turns. Wherever you just put your hand up. One thing I love about Jesus is. One thing I love about Jesus is every time I fall, he's always there to catch me. Amen. Amen. Great. Great. Yep. Tom, you got right, right in the back, back, back. Okay. Okay. One thing I love about Jesus is in the middle of sorrow, he can give joy. Amen. That's great. Love it. Okay. Logan, go ahead. One thing I love about Jesus is that he knows me. He knows everything about me, everything from the minute I was born, and it doesn't matter. He still loves me. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. One thing I love about Jesus is he's my beloved. Okay. One thing I love about Jesus is his kindness yeah, amen. and his compassion towards people and that he's always going to help us no matter what. One thing I love about Jesus is that he's my rock of refuge yeah. and he shelters me in the storm. Yeah, amen. Take a couple, there's one behind you there. We'll, we'll get a, just a few more. So one thing I love about Jesus is my eyes have been opened. All right. One thing I love about Jesus is that he, he knows me and he still loves me. I hear that. That's right. I'm going to just take one more, <laughs> all the hands. Okay, we'll take more than one. <laughs> keep going, keep going, keep going. <laughs> one thing I love about Jesus is because he has saved my life. The one thing I love about Jesus is as a new widow, I am never, ever alone. Or we'll go two more. Go here and we'll go here. <laughs> Just two more. Okay. One thing I love about Jesus is he's my faithful high priest and he's always praying for me. Yeah, amen. That's right. That's right. That's right. One thing I love about Jesus, we're still here and we're still alive. Amen. amen. That's right. That's right. One thing I love about Jesus is that... Um, I am a gift. He gave me a gift for everybody, whoever needs me in need time. So, yeah. And I'm also, one thing I love about Jesus is that he helped me guide through life and then go through the right path. And then I seek the right path, too. So, All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you all for sharing. I'm glad that Jesus is important to you. And I'm glad that you love him. 
And my hope is this morning that, again, we will see him clearer and that your love will go deeper, your honor will go higher, your faithfulness to follow him will increase. And if you were with us last week, you'll remember, hopefully, that we were talking about Jesus' claims and what he claimed about his identity without saying a word as he entered Jerusalem on a young donkey during the Passover festival and what that means for us. Again, setting the scene, this is the last week of Jesus' life according to the Gospel of John. We just saw him enter into Jerusalem as the city was swelled with people. Millions of people, this is what historians are telling us, were there. And everyone was talking about and anticipating and wondering if Jesus would come and is this the Messiah or is he not? And what would the religious people, religious leaders do? And what would he say and what would he do? So there was heightened anticipation and a little angst about what was happening. And here comes Jesus. And if you remember from our passage from last week, it concludes with, the whole world has gone after him. Now, this was said from the mouth of a Pharisee as they were trying to stop people from coming to Jesus. They marveled at all of these people who were gathering around him saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they said, the whole world is coming after him. And indeed, it is. So in our next section, and this is where we're starting with um, this morning, again, John chapter 12, starting with verse 20. By the way, on the Pew Bible right in front of you, page 925, page 925, we're going to pick up the story together to see then what happens next. So this is John chapter 12 starting with verse 20, and we're going to break, break it up, and there's a lot of points this mo- morning, so I'm going to move fairly quickly through them. John 12, 20. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to, the, to worship at the festival. They said to Philip, who was a disciple, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, with a request, Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. I love that question. (laughs) Sir, we want to see Jesus. Now, it's been said, and I've read this and I've heard this throughout the years, that that phrase, sir, we want to see Jesus, should be engraved in every pulpit to remind the preacher, the speaker, that people ultimately need to see Jesus. Right? More than our cat stories, more than our opinions, that ultimately you and I need to see Jesus every Sunday. And hopefully when you come into this building, and we come, granted, lots of different reasons. I I get it, right? My prayer is that we, as a congregation, that would be our heart as well. It wouldn't be a bad thing to put on as you enter the sanctuary. (laughs) We want to see Jesus. And so these Greeks, who perhaps traveled from a long way, wanted to see him. And so now we see Jesus' response, and it's a curious response. He doesn't tell his disciples, in this case, Andrew and Philip, bring them here. He says some remarkable things. Now this is, again, in response to the request of people wanting to see him. And so in this teaching, in this section, we're going to look at at how we are to see Jesus as he described it himself so that, number one, we'd recognize how he wants to be seen, how he wants to be understood, how he would like us to communicate 
about him. So this is important information. As Jesus was saying, okay, they want to see me. This is how I want and must be seen. So this is John 12, now going to verse 23. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies... It remains only a single seed. First main point. See Jesus dying in your place. The hour has come. Jesus knew what was going to happen at the end of this week in which he would be glorified. We are glorified, though there is glory in our finest acts. If you're a sports person, it would be the highlight reel of the times in which you made the play or the catch or the tackle or scored the point. Jesus was saying now is the time in which he wants to primarily be remembered for. That is dying in, we're going to personalize it, my place, your place. If you don't know this already, the wrath of God is against sin. What sin is, ultimately, is a trespass It is going against or outside or beyond the borders in which God says is safe and right and good for you. We see this, of course, in the ultimate place, the Ten Commandments, that God gave us a list of things. The four first, going against trespasses or sins against God. The remaining six have to do with our relationship with one another. And God, indeed, being righteous, and holy and just, also being loving and kind and full, and full of grace. These are characteristics about God. And so we have sinned against God. Has any of you lived perfectly? You just broke a commandment being a liar. (laughs) None of us have. (laughs) And so God being just has to hold us accountable to these things. But also God being loving knew that we deserved the punishment for our sins. And Jesus who lived perfectly committed no crime, said, I will bear their punishment. And so he volunteered, planned from eternity past to take the punishment. And he being the only one qualified to do so, choose to take my place because of his great love. The first thing you you need to know about Jesus and seeing him, that he died in your place. And perhaps you've known this truth your whole life, but I want you to remind yourself of the joy of your salvation, right? Regardless of how good or how bad your day goes, if you believe in Christ, the end is going to be really, really good, Joy in my salvation. Jesus wants to be seen dying in our place. And in dying in our place, it's connected now to the second part of verse 24. Saying, but if it dies, using an allegory, an image, it produces many seeds. So not only did Jesus die in your and my place, 
see Jesus now producing new life. Jesus died as one seed to produce new life and many seeds. He produces new life now and will indeed do so for eternal life then. One died in the place for the many so that the many will truly live. I heard this quote once. I'm not sure where it's from. It says that you can count the seeds in an apple, right? We can count those seeds. But no one can count as many apples are in a seed. We don't know what God will produce. And in Christ dying, he produced new life in us. And as we follow him, we die to our sinful nature. And God produces and produces and produces. Jesus died in our place to produce new life. And this is our testimony. This is God's work in our heart. This is God meeting with us through Christ. And His death brings and has brought and will bring new life. Jesus communicated this. But if He dies, it produces many seeds. Now let's continue in verse 25. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Now this is an important teaching. There's a sermon right within these two verses. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Well, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. This is the point from this section. See Jesus instructing us to follow him. Jesus died in our place so that we can get new life. And we know that we believe in him, we'll get new life in his name. But our commitment to Christ, our making him Lord of our life, is the starting line, not the finishing line. Okay? Jesus says, now come follow me. Being a Christian is more than just saying a prayer, right? It is following Christ, which means significant things. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. What's that about, right? Loving their life in this world, saying that all I want to do is live for my life, to love my life in this world. So I'm not going to do anything that's hard. I'm going to try to collect all the pleasures I can or all the money I can. I'm going to stay away from difficult people and difficult situations. I'm going to avoid every pain. I'm going to try to fly first class everywhere and have the largest boat and the biggest screen TV and the best life ever. I love my life. If your sole purpose in living is about here and now, you will lose your life in eternity. Do you hear me? Right. Well, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it. Right? Now, is there a problem with enjoying aspects of your life? No. Right? Eat the cake. It's good. <laughs> Thank you. God does give us things to enjoy. I'm not speaking against that. It's the orientation of our mind. Right? Following Christ, sometimes you do things that your flesh does not want to do, and you can say amen, right? right? Sometimes I'd rather just stay home and watch Monday night football instead of going to the Monday night prayer meeting. Be real honest, right? I like watching football, right? <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> but I know it's better for me, and my time will be better spent. Turn off the t TV and go join my brothers and sisters. There are times when people need some help moving, right? 
been easier just to stay home, right, and do nothing. But you do it because of love, right? And I know at the end of the day and throughout the day, I'm blessed through it. This is our orientation for life, and we have to take these words seriously. What are you living for? While anyone who hates their life in the world, and sometimes it's hard, right? that person will keep their life for eternity. Verse 26 is strong. All of this is strong. Whoever serves me, what, what's the word there? Is it, yeah, might be a good idea to follow me. <laughs> oh, I suggest that you follow me. It's not that. Whoever serves me must. If you're a person who highlights in your Bible, highlight this. Whoever serves me must follow me. Because where I am, my servant also will be. Now in Scripture, we're called friends of God, children of God. We're called sheep. We're called lots of things. We're also called servants, recognizing that he's the one who died for us, took our wrath upon him. In him, our belief in him gives us new life eternal, and now we live to serve him, to honor him, to follow him, and I'd rather be where Jesus is in difficulty than be where he is not in ease. Where my servant is, that's where I am. And where I am, my servant will also be. So we pray, God, what are you doing, Jesus? What are you saying? I want to be with you. I want to follow you. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Whose honor are you living for? Your own? People? Or ultimately, your Father? Here's the formula and instructions of Jesus. You go up here. Go to the next slide, if you would, please. This is the promises of Jesus. This is just in this passage. Go ahead and click through, if you would. We die, promises, we bear much fruit. So these are conditional promises. If you die, you'll bear much fruit for Christ and the kingdom, fruit in your own life, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, these things. We have to die to our flesh. I'm not talking physically dying, but to our old nature who wants to sin and wants to be all about itself. We die, we bear much fruit. We hate our lives in this world, We keep our lives for eternal life. Next, please. We follow Jesus on the Calvary Road. Follow me. We join Jesus where he is in glory. We become servants. The Father honors us. Will you please live this way? We need help. We need the Holy Spirit's help. He will help you think about this. Someday, we will not be in this room anymore. Either Jesus returns or we go to him, right? A hundred years from now, none of us will be sitting in this room. And if you are, you are a medical miracle. (laughs) We will be in eternity. Part of my job is to show you Jesus, of course, and show you what he says. I want you to think about this. What are you living for? Are you, if you're a believer, serving him, losing your life, (laughs) gaining your life? Jesus instructed us to follow him. So Jesus died in our place to bring new life. And he instructs us or commands us or invites us to follow him. If you're explaining the gospel, 
this would be a good thing to talk about. Now what he continues to say, John 12, 27. Okay, is this him talking in response to this request? We want to see him. Then he says, verse 27, now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? <laughs> no. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So see Jesus glorifying the Father. What Jesus went through is no joke, right? Horrific what he had to endure physically, emotionally, relationally, mentally, spiritually being cut off from his father. Horrific, right? He knew it was going to be painful. And so if he was living his life just to make his life great, he would have said, let's skip this whole thing, right? And let's just continue to move on. But he knew he had to do it for greater glory of the Father. By the way, Christ's main mission wasn't to save you. It was to bring glory to his Father. And in glorifying his Father, people needed to understand who he was and is seen in the self-sacrifice of the Son for our behalf. Right? Does this make sense? So if you think that, if you think that his number one goal was to save you, you are mistaken. You are not the center of Christianity. Christ is. God is. He lived to glorify the Father. So if we are then following Jesus, walking in His footsteps, God, help me, help us to live for God's glory. Do you understand that? Right? You make different choices. You think differently about your time or your energy or what you'll say or what you shouldn't say. How you spend your money, so on and so, so forth. See Jesus glorifying the Father. So again, if you're talking about Christ, you talk about why He came to glorify God, seen in His invitation to follow us, made possible by Him creating new life in us, which happened because of God's great, great love in dying in our place for the wrath deserved us. This is how Jesus answered the question, if they want to see me, see me in these ways. See me glorifying the Father. Now he continues in verse 28, the second part. Now this is, <laughs> this is incredible. Then a voice came from heaven. Could you, could you imagine that? Right. Here's Jesus teaching. We don't know how many people were there. And it says it sounded like thunder. If you read Psalms and scriptures, it says that God's voice is like thunder. He said these things and all of a sudden, I have glorified it. And will glorify it again. Now the crowd that was there and heard it said it thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not for mine. Next point, see Jesus validated by the Father. Remember this tension? The Jewish leaders were saying, you are a deceiver, you're a devil, we're going to kill you, you are a distractor, you're drawing people to himself. Jesus says, I'm here to glorify God. And they said, you don't represent the Father. And here's Jesus saying these things about himself. And then God, in a, all, the Father, in an uh, audible voice, <laughs> says, that's my boy. That's my son. Right? 
validating his identity, saying, I'm glorified and I will glorify it again. If you were there hearing this and you heard this voice saying this literally out of nowhere, that should rock you to the soul of your being. Jesus was not here on his own accord trying to create a religion. He was representing and glorify his Father. And Jesus was the creator coming to his greatest creation, which was humankind. And as he continually showed the people who he was, that he was the Messiah, he and the Father were one. He is the great I am. Talking, this voice comes in. I have glorified you as you are glorifying me, and I will glorify it again. This was to help people to believe. So in sharing about Christ, understand he wants to be known as one who has God the Father's approval. Even though he's a part of the Trinity, that's there not coming on his own accord. He is validated by the Father. So Jesus is just not a moral teacher. Get that out of your mind. Again, you've heard me talk about this, that society often, if we did a person on the street tell me about Jesus, often they'll say, well, he's a great example. Is that all he was? Well, he's a great teacher. Is that it? Much more than that. No one like him. And his claims are significant greater than Gandhi or Buddha or Muhammad or whomever. You want to fill in the blank? It's important for us to understand. Jesus continues in verse 31. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. So see Jesus overthrowing the prince of this world. Now what is this about? The prince of this world, according to Scripture, by the way, is called by many names, either the devil or Satan or the deceiver or the liar or the great adversary. The accuser saying in front of God the Father when a time of judgment comes, hey, 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 let me tell you about Eric Fish. Yeah, you see all the good things and how he has has an organization and he loves people, but I know I got the dirt on Eric. (laughs) (laughs) Or Dave. And guess what? He does have the dirt on you. How is the prince of this world overthrown? By the blood of Jesus Christ. Who covers our sin. So Jesus was saying, hey, in this, I'm going to set you free from the penalty and the power of sin. Giving you new life by regeneration, by the Holy Spirit, that there would be forgiveness. And so the accuser, the prince of this world, is driven out. This was prophesied from the opening pages of the book of Genesis, where God pronounced a curse on humankind because we trespassed and talked about this accuser. He said, he will strike your heel, but you will crush his head. That is the fruit that came through, which was Christ. This was coming true in the cross. So Jesus know that he is overthrown and overthrowing and brought judgment on the world, taking judgment on himself, the prince of this world. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. I put other scriptures in here. That's Ephesians 2, 1 through 7, talks about this. Take a look at it. Two more things. This is an answer again. 
We want to see Jesus. Verse 32. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. See Jesus drawing all people to himself. Belief in Christ is not for an elite group of people. He draws everyone. From the person in the highest post and position to one in the lowest place. From those who committed grievous, grievous sin to those who have been mumbling around and trying to be a good person on their own strength. God calls all people to himself, to Christ. This is important. Jesus is the gate All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Doesn't mean everyone will. I want everyone to have an opportunity to. All who confess their sins, God is faithful and just and what will forgive their sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's good news. Jesus draws all people to himself through his death. And we have opportunity to proclaim this message. It's for Hindus, it's for Jews, it's for Muslims, it's for atheists, it's for self-righteous religious people. See him dying Lifted up, drawing people to himself. Now, here's a response of the crowd, and we'll come to our last point. So again, this passage opened up by this request of these Greeks. Jesus then gave these teachings, telling us in doing so that this is how I want to be seen in these things. In verse 34, the crowd spoke up. They were a little confused. What are you talking about being lifted up? What are you talking about dying? The crowd spoke up. Now, we've heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever, right? They knew Old Testament scripture. Mistakenly, (laughs) but they knew it. So they said to Christ, how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Right? So who is the Son of Man? Are you talking about yourself or are you talking about somebody else? Right? By the way, the Son of Man is a reference from Daniel chapter 7 describing the Messiah. Right? Verse 35, then Jesus told them, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they're going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. Last point. See Jesus shining the light. (laughs) Jesus tells them, listen, I'm the light. Did he say this before? I'm the light of the world. Have we read this before? We just saw it last week that those call out in their tight place, in their darkness, in their pain, and God's light will shine on them. And all of us at some point have been in a very dark place. Jesus says, call to me and my light will help you. Follow me. Walk in my light. Believe in me and in so doing that The light that I am now comes to reside in you by the Holy Spirit so that we will join him in drawing people to Christ, illuminating what is true, what is right, what is just, what is good, what is loving, these things. 
So Jesus says, yes, the Messiah will remain forever. However, he will die first. They didn't quite understand that because they were so looking forward to the Messiah coming in and destroying the Roman occupiers and making their life awesome, right? And pushing out everything and everyone that was coming upon them. And what Christ came initially is to free them and free us from the sin that comes from within us. That's our greatest need. And God knew this, and Jesus came to free us not from occupiers externally, but from squatters internally, things in us that are there. First time, he came into Jerusalem on a donkey. Second time, he's coming in a white horse. Read Revelation 19. Jesus shines the light, shines in the darkness, shines in our darkness, if we call on him. You may become children of light. Last part of this section, this is intriguing. So when he finished speaking, Jesus left, and he hid himself from them. If you do not see Jesus as he is, you will not see Jesus at all. People started looking for him. He says all of these things, see me as... Then he hid himself. That's a significant action. Again, we must see him as Savior. We must see him as God. We must see him as Lord. Follow me. And if people miss that about Christ... They completely miss him. And there are people throughout the world right now, there are probably people in this building right now that don't see Christ as he is. And my hope as we sang, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, I want to see you, sir. We want to see Jesus. So, I don't know where you are today, and I hope that a sentence is struck with you, or a paragraph, or a concept. And so we're going to sing again, and I'm going to pray, yes, yet again. And so perhaps you say, you know what, I have just believed things about Jesus, but I haven't believed in Jesus Make a decision today. Make him your Lord. I don't care if you've been sitting in these pews for 60 years. If you haven't made that decision, make it. Some of you are still on the edge, and I get it. So glad you're here. Hopefully this is making sense to you. Investigate, look, listen, learn, make a decision Some of us, you are a Christian. Are you following Christ from a distance? I'm following him. I think he's over that hill over there, but I'm busy over here playing music. Nothing against musicians, I just say. You understand what I'm saying, right? Are are you, who are you living for, right? Are you hearing me here? Who are you living for? Lose your life. Lose your life so you'll gain it. <laughs> I want us all to, all to be the biggest losers, right? <laughs> Dave, that wasn't funny. Well, this came to mind. So that we'll gain, we'll be the biggest gainers, okay? 
And so you talk to the Lord. So I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to be done. Right? If you want more prayer, come on up. Right? If you need some space alone, take it. Right? If you want to hang out, do that. Do whatever you need. So Father, here we are. Again, gathered together. You are here with us today. I know that because you said you would be. We asked you to. And I've seen you work externally, and I trust you working internally. God, thank you for my friends in this room. They are friends. So many of them just love you. And God, I know you see, but I've seen so many people serve you doing this stuff that no one knows about or in the back room or just helping people or doing all that. God, grateful for that. And help us, Father, as a congregation to follow you in obedience that comes through faith. That we would say, you, my Lord, what you've done for me, I want to be with you and live for you. So God, help us to think about these things beyond today. Uh, into this week, my hope is the rest of our lives that we think about your teaching, Jesus, your life, Jesus, what you mean to us. Thank you, God, for the promise of being with us, of honoring those who have sacrificed. We love you. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.